Chapter 12, Tropical Climates. Tropical climates are located between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, with the equator running down their middle. Subtropics are further away from these two boundaries, extending up to the 38th parallel and into the mountainous regions of the tropics themselves. All areas of the tropics experience intense evaporation from vertical sun exposure, and none of these areas described have a uniform range across the planet. They almost all extend throughout the equatorial zones. Disease, mosquitoes, and perpetual growth make it a difficult climate for human habitation, but with proper design, it can be one of the fastest places to establish a fully functioning self-sufficient home site. Wet Tropics These areas are at and around the equator and are constantly bombarded with rain because the perpetual overhead sun is causing constant evaporation. The clouds, heavy with moisture, can't help but release it. The sun slowly wobbles in the sky without much angle change over the course of the year. Vegetation runs wild in an effort to cover the soil and tie up nutrients in the biomass. Most life and most of the biomass is in the canopy of the rainforests. The soils are almost all functionally infertile. When European colonists arrived in the tropics and applied temperate climate farming techniques, it was disastrous for the soils, ecologies, and the people. It should be noted that volcanic soils, some terraces, and floodplains in this region can retain their fertility and support more than rainforest emulating food forest systems. Because pathogens reproduce and spread quickly in the wet tropics, proper sewage treatment and isolation from groundwater is critical. Furthermore, water sources in general have to be regularly monitored for purity. Open water becomes a breeding ground for mosquitoes that carry pathogens. Natural insect controls, strict hygienic practices with water and waste, and raised homes with natural airflow and screens are all needed. Wet dry tropics. Further away from the equator, five to 10 degrees, 15 to 20 degrees, latitudinal degrees away, where we are not immediately below the sun, we get a wet and dry season. The sun's path alters throughout the year to a greater degree, creating more differentiation in climate and ecology. An example of this kind of climate would be Hawaii. Winters are the dry period in these tropics where they experience desiccating winds. Heavier flooding and rains usually arrive in wet summer season. The summer growth can be immense, creating both a challenge for farmers and an opportunity for designers. These areas constitute the tropical savanna and are home to many grazers, zebras, antelope, water buffalo, and more. There are also large predators to manage the grazers. Agriculture in this area is easier because the dry winter gives the soil respite and more fertility has been built over time. But overgrazing, erosion, fire and over tilling are all still real concerns in this climate. Windbreaks or hedgerows are needed against the winter winds. Constant mulching is needed to keep soil rich in organic matter. Monsoon tropics. A type of wet dry tropics, monsoon tropics extend further than other regions, zero to 35 degrees. Monsoons are extremely heavy summer rain periods preceded by building heat starting in spring and caused by a switch in the direction of the winds from inland to offshore. The soils are less nutrient rich and in winter tend to be hard and brittle. Tropical soils. Unless it is an area with volcanic soils or Amazonian terra preta, tropical soils are lacking in nutrients in comparison to the soils of the temperate climates. The constant rains leach nutrients out of the soil. Plants are the biological reserves of nutrients in the tropics, not the soils. Some sandy soils are so well draining that plants have a difficult time establishing. Legumes are vital in creating a living network for other plants to rely upon as they establish and create humus and more structure beyond the sand. Adding clay can also be helpful. For gardens in this region, plastic lined trenches, beds in sunken water tanks, or garden row glaze need to be employed to prevent water from leaving too quickly. Organic matter from trees, mulch plants, and even aquatic plants can be added to the soils. Composting in this region is difficult, and growing annual legumes like cowpeas or green manure crops to chop and drop is more effective. Ants, termites, and also a few worms help develop and maintain the soils in this region. 
the maximum sizes for growing spaces in the tropics vary slightly, but in general, the stereotypical temperate climate field is inappropriate. The average U.S. farm is over 400 acres. That's 165 hectares. Most of these farms are managed in large open fields, hundreds of acres in size. Most of these farms are managed in large open fields, hundreds of acres in size. Smaller open spaces work better with tree systems around them to support them. Perennial, polycultural food systems supported by legume or nitrogen-fixing trees are ideal for this region as tillage or any soil disturbance sets the ecosystem back sharply and recovery can take a very long time if damage is severe. Grazing cattle herds are not naturally found in most of the tropics outside the savanna, so graze carefully and lightly. Start small and work your way up. Use manure, annual legumes, and tree legumes. Grow perennials more than annuals, trees more than understory, and food forests more than fields, and return as much organic matter to the soil as possible. Tropical earthworks. Excessive water can be managed with terraces, swales, chinampas, and pits to drain water off of croplands to prevent soil from being waterlogged and then potentially anaerobic, and to turn the excess water into aquaculture. Terraces both wet and dry are common in the tropics for rice or taro, wet, and small seed grains, dry. Diverting and sinking water into slash piles for bananas, papayas, and other water and nutrient-hungry plant gilt is also a passive and powerful technique. Tropical food forests. In many tropical areas of the world, home gardens have traditionally been food forests. In some areas, local communities relied upon the natural tropical forest for foraged food. But now that these forests are largely gone, they have lost the traditions with which to restore them. Luckily, food forests are easily established in the tropics. This area prefers perennials since annuals work in disturbance, and tropics cannot handle consistent disturbance. The tropics are ideal for food forestry. Many exotic medicinals come from this region as well and can easily be grown. Tall canopy. Jackfruit, breadfruit, coconut, avocado, cashew, and pecan. Palms. Over and understory, like coconut and Chilean wine palm. Understory layers of trees, giant herbs, and large bushes. Coffee bean, cacao, banana, and taro. Clumpers, cardamom, turmeric, bamboo, and sugarcane. Ground covers and vines, sweet potatoes and yams. Tropical gardens. Tropical gardens are not tidy like the traditional temperate climate garden. They are larger and more rampant. Soil fertility is largely maintained through chopping and dropping mulch and green manure plants. High shade is vital to allow an early and late light, but block the midday intense solar radiation. The gardens, though containing annuals which require soil disturbance, are more like microclimates in food forests than temperate gardens. They are small, roughly a quarter acre, a 1,000 square meters size areas. Raised beds, chinampas, and berms can be used to decrease the moisture content of the soil. Timing is essential in gardening in the tropics. Growth and decomposition are moving so quickly that opportunities for intervention are brief and easily missed. The tropics can also have no dormant season. It can be constant growth year round. One to two acres, 4,000 to 8,000 square meter fields for annuals, often using alley cropping agroforestry mulch and pollard from alley cropping trees, chicken or duck tractoring between crop cycles, terraces, perennials, bananas, pineapple, grains, cucurbits, and sugarcane. Banana or papaya circle, a classic permaculture design example where a mulch pit is lined with desirable plants that feed on the fertility of the decomposing mulch. Gardeners do something similar when they sink porous containers full of compost in their gardens and surround them with tomato plants. It creates a passive feeding situation for high production. Slash piles of mulch and biodegradable waste can be used similarly, but in any shape if there is enough moisture. Pollards. By consistently pruning the top branches of vigorous trees that respond well to persistent pruning, we can get a consistent yield of straight sticks or canes for biochar, weaving, 
building or stick fire fuel. The pace of growth in the tropics makes it an ideal location for pollarding. Chop and drop. Chop and drop at the start of summer. Winter is dry and spring is hot. You need the moisture of summer rains to properly break down the cut greens. Moisture contains the breakdown and keeps its products traveling down into the soil instead of oxidizing. Biochar. Biochar is biologically infused charcoal. Charcoal is made at high temperatures in a low oxygen environment, pyrolysis. Biochar is made when the charcoal is soaked in compost here combined with compost. When charcoal is created, all the life and moisture is removed. What remains is like a porous carbonaceous vacuum. It provides habitat for soil life, but charcoal alone as a soil amendment will rob the humus of water and nutrients. It should be noted that biochar has unique electrical capacity abilities such that it can store information like a silicone chip can. Scientists are eagerly researching and testing biochar for new applications currently. We are also just learning that different specific heats for making biochar create different types of biochar and the plant mediums used make a difference as well. The Redwood Forest Foundation, for example, makes a superb biochar at a specific heat in a specialized kiln of 600 degrees Fahrenheit or 315 and a half degrees Celsius. But that doesn't mean that superb biochar can't be made at other heats each for a specific purpose. Biochar was inspired by terra preta, a dark, rich, man-made soil from areas of the Amazon that was created using charcoal, fish bones, pottery, humanure, and bones. Biochar is gaining attention as a carbon sequestration method as it takes biomass that would be burned and instead turns it into a durable carbon compound that improves soils. In some areas, terra preta is the best solution to depleted topsoils. It should be noted that making biochar is a biomass intensive process as it requires organic matter for both the compost and the charcoal. For those in the tropics or the temperate climates where biomass is plentiful and constantly generating, it can be a powerful tool for building soil. If the site only has its standing living carbon to be turned into biochar, it has to be imported. Luckily, it's superbly lightweight and becomes a nearly permanent soil amendment. It can help in desertifying regions. They shouldn't use up the last of their trees to make it though. Many sites in contrast have an abundance of biomass that can be turned into biochar. Biochar can be made quite simply by stacking your dried wood or organic matter so air can pass through the pile, small sticks at the bottom, bigger sticks in the middle, and a bird's nest of sticks on top and then lighting it from the top. Top lighting or conservation burning is a cleaner burning method than lighting from the bottom, especially if you are a farmer burning agricultural waste already. Top lighting produces much less smoke, estimated 98% less particulates. It is a clean burning method according to Sonoma Biochar and Blue Sky Biochar and while it does create biochar, it is one of the crudest methods light from the downwind side, so the fire is both sheltered and fed by the wind. The conservation method burn converts unburned biomass into approximately 15% charred biomass. There are other methods where heat is applied around the wood in a kiln and the wood never catches flame but still turns into charcoal. Arresting the burning process is critical. Spray the pile down with water before the charcoal starts to burn into ash, which is the second stage of burning. Spraying it down with microbial infused waters also immediately imprints the char with life. Quatamakvia of Sonova Biochar Initiative uses EM infused water to cool his biochar piles. The char should be very brittle and glassy looking. Use a shovel to break up the char to create more surface area. Though try to avoid pulverizing it since biochar dust is nowhere near as effective. Tropical Animal Systems Sanitation is a primary concern for contaminant systems with animals in the tropics. Waste need to be washed away and cycled as soon as possible. Housing for animals must be designed to let waste flow downhill to be easily washable and to infiltrate and be absorbed into forage systems to return as animal feed. These animals rarely free graze. They are contained and brought their feed contained in animal tractors, open bottom pens for portable grazing, or monitored or tethered while grazing. Rabbits, ducks, chickens, pigs. Tropical aquaculture. 
While aquaculture has the highest yield of all forms of cultivation, it is perhaps most prolific in the tropics because lacking a dormant time period and thriving on consistent high temperatures, waste cycles are fast and rich pond sludge quickly accumulates. Chinampas are ideal as are wet terraces for rice and duck systems. Ponds with herbivore fish can have forage plants along their edges for fish to feed upon. These plants can be food for fish, people, and animals. Rabbit, duck, or chicken manure can create temporary algae blooms in the pond for fish to feed upon, but use with care as too large a bloom will suffocate the fish and other pond life. Tropical housing. In humid and hot climates, evaporative cooling is not an option. Only dehumidification air movement and shade can be used. Buildings must be oriented to the direction of the prevailing winds, not the sun path. There is rising air during the day and falling air during the night, so orienting the sun so that the exchange passes through the building is critical. Avoid heat sources and thermal masses. Even cooling thermal masses like caves create mold fungi and mildews. Thin walls and roofs prevent heat from being stored in them during the day and quickly release whatever heat they've accumulated at night. A solar pump can be used to draw heat out of buildings and white or reflective paint can be used on the outside surface of buildings. Complete shading can also be accomplished with layers of palms or large legume trees which allow airflow beneath their canopy. Roofs are steep to avoid direct orientation to the sun and usually thatched to allow heat to easily leave. If in a flood zone and on stable soils, housing may be raised or sheltered by earth banks. Distance is maintained between the house and other structures and interceptive trees or plants to help airflow. Trellis is used to create more shade and extend the garden areas around the house without obstructing airflow. Kitchens are outdoors unless there is a cold season, in which case there may be two kitchens, indoors and outdoors. Sealable, cold food storage is critical to keeping food safe and long lasting. It is also important that the kitchen area be designed to be cleaned easily. Safe toilets. In the tropics, clean toilets are of utmost importance. They can easily become transmission sites for deadly pathogens if poorly designed. Septic tanks in the tropics tend to poison the groundwater. Dry compost toilet systems are ideal with a one meter drop which aerates the waste with a fall and impact. And then it tumbles at ideally a 45 degree angle and lands on a greater mesh to be aerated as it decomposes. A black pipe solar pump extending from the bottom of the toilet to two to three meters, six to nine feet above the top of the toilet is used to siphon off the gases from the waste. It works just like a rocket stove's tower. Liquid and solid are separated by the grating, which allows for more aeration and for these materials to break down separately. Safe drinking water. The continuous heat and relentless growth in the tropics leads to all decomposition and growth cycles working at their fastest possible speeds. That means in water and in soil, aerobic cycles work so quickly in the tropics that they can use up all the oxygen and anaerobic cycles and organisms can contaminate the soil, compost, or water quickly. This makes composting difficult and timing crucial, but it also means that pathogens breed in our drinking water incredibly fast. So problems can easily spin out of control if not corrected promptly. Regular monitoring, screening, and safe storage are critical for keeping water safe in the tropical regions. Insect screening and netting. Screening over rain gutters, water storages, and windows to keep out insects is critically important in the tropics where insects spread viruses and pathogens. Homes, bedrooms, beds, and fruit trees can be covered with netting. Habitats for bats, amphibians, and birds that feast on mosquitoes and, and other insects can be built around the home for added protection. Gray water treatment beds. Remember, testing water is critical both on the way in and on the way out. Multiple reed beds in succession made out of concrete basins may be necessary to filter out all the pathogens, toxins, heavy metals, and excess nutrients. You may even need to follow a reed bed with more diverse and complex biological filter plants and animal guilt as specific toxins can be persistent without the right plant in the system to cycle it. Gray water treatment reed beds are even being encouraged and regulated by local governments in areas of Australia. 
Bamboo. This incredibly versatile and useful plant grows especially well in the tropics. The tender shoots are edible. The mature poles are a sturdy and durable building material. It can be made into biochar or fuel. The power of bamboo to sequester carbon rests upon the fact that it is a perennial grass and can be constantly harvested without damaging the vigorous root systems. It spreads creating areas of monoculture so they do require management and planning. Wandering root systems can be controlled with subsoil plowing or hardscape like steel plating. Plan the placement of bamboo carefully. Ripping out the root system requires machinery most often, but can be made into rich compost. Quote, managed bamboo forests sequester more carbon than natural bamboo forests. This is because harvesting stimulates growth and treatment of harvested combs allows for long-term sequestration in bamboo products. Eric Tonesmeyer, The Carbon Farming Solution, 2016.